Okay, welcome back to the Classics in Immunology Journal Club. And before we get started, I just want to say, if you like this video, like it on the thing, click on the thumbs up thing, and then on the, click on the bell to get notified of more and scroll down on the YouTube site and click on the uh, my website and uh, click on the writing tab on the website and you'll find all the classic papers and you can read them to your heart's content. And also check out Twitter, K.A. Smith SRQ, and uh, that you might find that interesting too. So today we're going to do one of my favorite papers because it's one of my papers. <laughs> and so it was published in July of 1986, and the authors were Julie B. Stern and myself. And the, the title is Interleukin-2 Induction of T-Cell G1 Progression and CMIB Expression. And as I said, it was in Science in uh, 1986 in July. Now, the background on this paper is that... Julie Stern was a uh, was a postdoc with me. She had just finished her PhD with another investigator at, at Dartmouth, who was a um, progeny of a Rockefeller uh, investigator who went on to win the Nobel Prize subsequently. And they were studying uh, intracellular messages on what happens on the con on, on to molecules on the inside of cells, how they knew where to go and what to do. And consequently, Julie was really uh, well versed in molecular techniques and so forth. And she came into my lab just at the right time, essentially, uh, as I'll get into. And she had an interesting background in that she was she was a little bit older than than most uh, grad students and first year postdocs in that um, she and her husband, her husband um, was a pediatrician, and they were Chilean. Um, in 1973, the the CIA and Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon assassinated Allende, who was the democratically uh, uh, elected president of, of the Republic of Chile. And they uh, essentially then put in, in his place a, a military dictator by the name of Pinochet, who persisted until the, the early 90s. And so what's going on in um, Eastern Europe right now um, is... We've been doing that all of our, all by ourselves for a long time. We, we should realize that. Anyway, um, Julie and her husband, Paul, were backers of the Allende, the socialist regime. And that's why they just, the CIA decided to get rid of this guy. Um, and so they had to get out. And they first made their, they, since it's a Spanish-speaking situation, they first made their way to Spain, spent some time there visiting old ancestors and relatives and so forth. And then... They got connected to the United States in New York, and uh, Paul took up with the uh, with the pediatrics people down there, and then ultimately moved up to Hanover, New Hampshire, because um, he moved with his mentor. Julie, at this stage, had already had children, and she went back to back to graduate school, and then on to her her first postdoc with me. So that was that was interesting. Now, the, the background in terms of the science in this paper. <laughs> that was the politics, is that this paper is about trying to dissect out uh, what the morphological and, and molecular mechanisms that account for cell proliferation, because that's what we were into at the time. And my ambition was to find, as I when I went to Hanover, New Hampshire, I said, I'm, people would ask me what, I, what I'm doing here. And I would tell them that I was trying to find the answer to camps to cancer in New Hampshire. I've always liked an alliteration. And so that, <laughs> that was good. So this is part of that whole scene. And it, it turns out that other studies that have been done on cells and cells in culture and how they grow, uh, essentially the, the, um, the, the papers go back to 1932, beginning with the, the way bacteria culture, uh, grew in culture and all the different kinds of um, species of, of fauna have been studied and they all had the same growth characteristics. And, uh, and um, ultimately, most of the ones in modern times, most of the, of the studies we had focused down on mouse embryo fibroblasts that were a, a particular uh, kind of, um, of cells that had been selected that had been passed when they were very sparsely um, occupying the bottom of a, uh, of a culture flask. They would pass 3,000 cells every three days. And so these were called 3T3 cells. And I looked at those very carefully before I got started on my, on my business because I, you know, everybody was studying 3T3 cells. But I, I found that when I got into the literature, the 3T3 cells, even though they were supposed to be normal, by comparison, all the other kinds of cells that had been were able to be kept in culture for any length of time were malignant. They were cancer cells. So the, the, the 3T3 cells were supposed to be the normal counterpart. 
it turns out uh, what, what I found was is that they had multiple genetic abnormalities in these three T3 cells. And I said to myself, well, to, that's not a very good model system to, to think that they really are normal when they're grossly abnormal and they have extra chromosomes and chromosome breaks and all kinds of things wrong with them. Uh, and so I decided not to spend my career studying 3T3 cells. And I found because I was a hematologist first in, in my um, clinical background, that lymphocytes were a, a really good cell source of normal cells. You could just get them out of the blood. Um, and they were, the, the great thing about lymphocytes is when I got into the game in the early 70s was is that it had already been shown that these cells were, were not growing when they're floating around in the blood. They were in so-called G0 of the cell cycle um, kinds of terms. And yet you could add things to them, mitogens like phytohemagglutin and PHA, and then they would undergo a characteristic um, progression uh, and replicate their DNA and then undergo mitosis. And that was first reported in 1960. And so that was the model system that I started studying to try to find out how it all worked. The, the, the problem with the, the other problem with the three T three cells was is that you could you could do this a similar kind of thing that we did in T cells, and that is you could you could have the cells growing in in culture medium containing serum, and you could you could take that medium off and, and um, replace it with um, medium without serum, and they would stop growing, and so that they would all sort of accumulate in G zero, and then you could add the serum back again. And then they would undergo a proliferative um, growth spurt. Now, the only problem with that, they didn't know what it was in, this, in the serum that was causing the cells to, to grow. Could have been one factor, three factors, all kinds of things, nutrition, all kinds of things that they didn't have in the, in the medium alone um, uh, controls. So um, in, in the preceding paper from my laboratory came out in 1984 in science, uh, authored by Doreen Cantrell and myself. And that was, and I reviewed that here in the Journal Club, and that was the, um, the development of the IL-2 T-cell system for studying uh, cellular growth. That's, that whole paper was absolutely um, groundbreaking in this field. Trouble was is that all the people in the field were studying 3T3 cells, and they didn't care anything about T-cells. But anyway, we reduced the variables that we were studying, and we found in, in a T-cell system, we could show that the only thing stimulating the growth of the cells was, was IL-2, and that only three variables you had to deal with, and you could predict when the cells would undergo DNA replication and mitosis. You had to know the concentration of the ligand, IL-2, and you had to know the concentration of the receptor on the cell surface, the density of the IL-2 receptor, and then you had to know the duration um, that the, those two molecules had to interact with one another. And then you had a very predictable system. The other thing that came out of those experiments was that the, only, the other problem with, with, um, with the immunology aspect of T-cells was is that most people have been studying by the time we got into the end of the game uh, for 10, 15, 20 years, they had been studying um, the cellular proliferation, T cell proliferation, that was started when they added ligands that would activate the T cell receptor. And so they activate the T cell receptor, and PHA was one of them that would activate all the T cells, and then the cells would, uh, would proliferate. And, and so that's where most immunologists stopped. They didn't care, they didn't care what ha after happened to the cells after they added their, their stimulus. They wanted. They were studying the, the early events of T cell receptor activation, and they were dealing with seconds and minutes and hours after, after they added the T cell, um, the ligands that would activate the T cell receptor. Well, the problem, and if you went beyond that, the problem was is that what the T cell receptor activation step did was is that it caused the cells to make interleukin two, and express interleukin two receptors, and then that whole process was going on almost simultaneously to whatever the T cell receptor it triggered. And it was, it was impossible to sort, sort it out uh, given that kind of a system. But the Cantrell Smith paper from 1984 uh, established a model system where you could do that. And you could separate the T cell receptor activation step from the IL-2 receptor act activation step. And that allowed us and in particular, Julie, because she was well-versed in molecular techniques, to begin to look at, at whether or not 
um, uh, IL-2 activated new gene expression that had never been shown before. Nobody knew how these so-called lymphodirects did their, did their deal. So the other thing that happened along this line at the same time was that in the cancer field, people were also using 3T3 cells to try to identify different agents, mostly RNA tumor viruses, but also DNA extracted from human tumor cells. And they showed in several labs in, uh, around the late 70s and early 80s, showed that, that you, could, you could make 3T3 cells transform their, what they looked like. They, looked, they went from being normal looking cells under the microscope to being grossly abnormal and looking like cancer cells. And that was the, that was a transformation assay. The other thing that that the uh, the this assay allowed them to do was is that they they could uh, they could so the the other thing that the the people that had to describe then around 1980 was is that if you added um, tumor cell DNA, human tumor cell DNA, and or or retroviruses derived from different animal systems, both mouses, chicken, and cat, and so forth. Is, is that you you could um, circumvent this uh, necessity for the cells to grow in serum containing medium. They would grow in serum free medium and they would still pile up and they would look uh, for all intents and purposes like abnormal cells, uh, cancer cells. So that 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 uh, was the beginning of the whole oncogene uh, business. And various genes were isolated using this uh, cell transformation assay. The only problem with that was is that you really couldn't study what the and then if they could show that if they used an isolated gene, they could make make the cells do the same thing, transform. But that was about it. It was it's like going back into the black box again. And they'd throw the genes into the culture and they'd look to see several days later whether or not they looked funny. And I decided to myself that that was there. We needed to devise another system to be able to study this at the molecular level. And the Cantrell Smith um, T cell IL two system was a natural, so that's where that's where this paper takes off and starts. That's the background. In the introduction to the paper, uh, we point out that the in the T cell system, it's very similar. What had been worked out in the three T three system was is that some signals seem to to make the cells competent to grow. So this was the competence. Uh, part of the whole process, but they didn't really grow. They didn't replicate DNA and they wouldn't undergo mitosis until you added other th stuff into the, into the mix. And then they would undergo what they call G1 progression to the S phase, the DNA synthesis phase. And then they would irrevocably go uh, undergo mitosis after that. So there were two phases of the 3T3 cell cycle, the competence phase and the progression phase. And that had been firmly established. And we talk about that because the T cells, what we knew from our uh, preliminary data and so forth, was, is that the T cell receptor was, was analogous to the competence factor in the 3T3 system, and IL-2 was the progression factor. We wondered then whether or not we could uh, use the T cell system to start looking at the what, whatever was going on molecularly inside inside the cells. And we knew we had several hours after triggering the T-cell receptor to study, and we had several hours after the IL-2 receptor to study. And so that's what we did for this paper. And what we had done there, by the time we started our experiments in the mid 80s, there have been at least 20 different genes that have been identified through the cell transformation assay uh, that were putative oncogenes. Howard Temin, just to go back a little bit, Howard Temin back in the 60s has, had uh, proposed, hypothesized that cancer was caused by genetic mutations in normal cellular genes. And that was called the cellular oncogene, uh, proto-oncogene hypothesis. And, and Temin was just really sort of, a, he was a scientist scientist from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And uh, he was a little nerdy, as a lot of scientists are. Um, you know, I'm not going to say anything more. But when he came up with this hypothesis in the 60s, he was really, he was ridiculed and he was laughed at, laughed out of meetings and, and all over the place. But he persisted. And um, that's a whole other story that I won't go into, but it, but it bears on, on this particular story. 
So in the materials and methods of this paper, um, we synchronized human T cells <clears throat> into G0, where they would sort of uh, uh, stop proliferating and, and all gather together in G0, waiting for us to do the next thing. And, and so what we would do is we take normal T cells from our lab benchmates and so forth, and we would activate them through uh, their T cell receptor using the anti-CD3 um, signaling molecule. We'd let them go a few days, then we'd wash out the CD3. We'd keep them in IL-2 growing for 14 days. And by that time, they, we knew from, from other experiments that, that they would express the IL-2 receptor, and then it would start to go down in, in density on the cell surface. And we knew we needed the IL-2 receptor for them to be able to grow in response to IL-2. Um, so at the end of 14 days, when the IL-2 receptor density was very low, uh, we would then reactivate these cells so that they would express IL-2 receptors. And the way we did that, we found that if we... If we didn't use anti-T3 again, rather if we used a four-ball ester, it would only activate part of the um, T cell receptor signaling pathways, and we would get IL-2 receptor expression, but the cells would not make IL-2. That was key, because then we could add IL-2 whenever we wanted and then we could study what happened after we added the IL-2. So we could study what happened after PDBU, 4 ball dibutyrate, because we could wash that out uh, in, a, in, in several hours after that. So that was the competent signal. And we could do the same thing, uh, similar things with IL-2 and the progression signal. At this stage of the game, Julie started out looking at many different kinds of oncogenes and, um, and studying what would what oncogenes might be expressed during the T-cell uh, cycle and had, had found she, several genes had already been looked at in this regard. One was um, C-MYC uh, and the other one uh, was C-FOS and they'd been shown to be activated by the T-cell receptor. So what she set out to do initially was to simply look at the cells under the microscope after the competence signal and after the uh, uh, progression signal see what they look like, see whether they change their morphology. And she could also study the, their, their metabolic um, features, such as she could study uh, RNA synthesis by adding in tritiated uridine, and she could study DNA synthesis, adding in tritiated thymidine. Uh, and so that's what we did. So the results are shown in figure one. And so figure one, shows the metabolic in the, in the A part of the figure, studies that we did, and then in B is the morphology. This is um, formal dibutyrate was added at, at times minus six, and then we, we could study what happened in the, in the six hours after that. And then at time zero, we would add in IL-2. And so the uh, diamonds here are tritiated uridine incorporation into the, into the cells. And the solid circles are uh, um, tritiated thymidine you know, DNA synthesis. So you can see that basically nothing happened after the four ball dibutyrate in either the uridine incorporation or the thymidine incorporation. And, and, but then at time zero, when IL-2 is added, for nothing really essentially happened until eight to, to eight hours or so. And then the uridine incorporation was much more elevated um, than, than it had been at time, at time zero. And lagging behind then was thymidine, and it wasn't really, you didn't really see that come up until 20 hours after the, uh, the, the addition of interleukin-2, and it peaked like at 24 hours and then started to fall off. So that was the metabolic situation with these cells. And if you looked at the, at the morphology, so I started as a hematologist. So this is the kind of thing that they, they taught me how to do in the clinic was to look at the blood film smear, they called it. And this is a similar experiment to the one I just showed you in the A part of the figure, except the PDBU was added at minus 12 hours at a time when the cells were small, you know, 100% small, round, resting lymphocytes. And then this is five hours after the addition of IL-2. They're still, for the majority of them, are small, around lymphocytes. And it's not until 10 hours after the addition of IL-2 that, and, and I should say this is uh, affinity, monoclonal antibody affinity purified IL-2, so it's homogeneous. Now you start to see blasts and you start to see mitoses. And at 20 hours, it just, it becomes much more 
um, obvious, essentially, that you've got an active culture going on. So that was the system we used. And we went on to then to look at, in figure, in figure two, uh, northern blot. Northern blots, and we used, we did a bunch of different, we looked for a bunch of different oncogenes. This is time zero, and this is C mib at a characteristic size of 3.8 kb, and this is 14 hours after the addition of IL 2. So it was clear that there was an expression of C mib that was that correlated with the progression phase and interleukin 2 um, activity. And then in, in figure three, we have the, um, the kinetics of C mib expression during the during the T cell cycle, and in the A in the A figure we have the competence phase, and in the B figure we have the progression phase, and so we have zero to six hours after the addition of four mole dibutyrate to these cells, and this is C mib express uh, C mic expression. Sorry, I don't want to confuse you. This is C mic expression, and then one of the other samples was C mib, uh, and then C fos, uh, and then um, one was uh, HLA antigens, and they're all baseline. And it's not until we start adding IL two at time zero here that we see um, a marked increase by five hours of C mib expression, which then falls off. And meanwhile, C mic, which is in the uh, triangles it doesn't really change very much during the progression phase. Then uh, if, if we go on to a figure three, the, the question was, what is maybe PDBU is that we're using to activate the T cell receptor and, the, and so that we can activate IL-2 receptor expression uh, is really, um, you know, mucking up the works and making it, we couldn't really conclude what we were concluding uh, with regard to T cell receptor stimulation and IL-2 receptor stimulation. And so what we did here in figure three uh, is, is that we, uh, we added um, PDBU here in, in the A figure here. And what, we've, what we're looking at is tritiated uridine incorporation in the triangles and tritiated thymidine incorporation uh, in the circles. So after about three days, we have um, a, an increase in the uridine incorporation. And then we take out IL-2 at three days. And when you take them out of this and let them go down to uh, five days, the uridine incorporation falls off. We can then add IL-2. So there's no PDBU on this whole thing. They, the cells at, at, at day four and day five are still IL-2 receptor positive. So we can give them back IL-2 uh, and then they would take off again. And you can see that within five or six hours, we see a marked increase in uridine incorporation. So, or in thymidine incorporation, uh, I'm sorry. In figure B then, we've got the same symbols essentially. And this is during 48 hours uh, of IL-2. And you can see that the, the same symbols are here for, for MIB expression, and it is basically specific for the IL-2-dependent progression phase of the cell cycle. Uh, and then in C, we have a dense, densitometric scanning of, the, of MIB, uh, C MIB messenger RNA dot plots with IL plus, plus or minus IL-2 on the day five cells. And you can see uh, it's positive when we add IL-2 and it's not positive when we don't add IL-2. So that was, that was figure four. Uh, that, that'll do it for that. So in the discussion of this paper, we've, we concluded based on our data that we had and what the cells looked like and also what their metabolic situation was and also what the expression of these different uh, oncogenes were, was is that the competence phase, um, the, the changes in the cells were very minor after activation of the T cell receptor. Um, by comparison in the IL-2 phase, the progression phase, there are all kinds of things that were happening, both morphologically, metabolically, and genetically in these cells. Uh, and so there must be many genes that were activated during the progression phase uh, 
preparing these cells to get ready for DNA replication, to have DNA replication, and then undergo mitosis. Now, and we thought it was especially pertinent that maximum CMIB expression uh, occurred at least five or six hours before the cells started to replicate DNA and before the morphological and metabolic changes that we were able to measure. Uh, and therefore, we, we, we surmised or we speculated that a critical concentration of CMIB messenger RNA and protein must be important for, uh, for, these, for, G, for G1 progression. Uh, in the past, uh, when this oncogene had been expressed, and we go into that a little bit here, is that the reason it's called MIB, M-Y-B, stands for myeloblastosis virus, and that it was first isolated from an RNA uh, tumor virus that caused acute leukemia in chickens and birds. And so that was MIB, and it was seemed to be specific for uh, transformation of hematopoietic cells. And when people had looked um, at the, the expression of CMIB in bone marrow cells uh, and, and so forth, they found that it was primarily in very immature precursors of the, of the mature blood cells, both the myeloid, erythroid, and so forth. And there, somehow they came to the conclusion that MIB expression was, was important for cellular differentiation because these cells were in the process of differentiating. However, after they differentiated and they became uh, mature end-stage cells, whether they're red cells or whether they're white cells, uh, they no, no longer expressed MIB. And so MIB was, expression was really confined to the immature cells that were proliferating. This becomes important going forward. The other thing was, by comparison, MIC expression, uh, as I showed in those, in those figures, occurred during the, the competence phase, but not the progression phase, not, didn't change during the progression phase. That was the paper. And subsequently, there's all, I have some stories for you that you might be interested in. The first thing was to us, and this is what we stressed in this paper, that this is the first paper that cytokines like interleuc or interleukins or any of these uh, lymphokines or lymphodrex cell uh, molecules and activities um, they could activate new gene expression. That's what we were really focused on. Meanwhile, all the rest of immunology couldn't have cared less. They were not interested in this whole thing. They, weren't in, they were not interested in trans cancer transformation. They weren't interested in cell cycles. They, they had never read the 3T3 cell cycle literature. They didn't know anything. To, nobody even heard of competence and progression in immunology. Um, so we, after we sent our paper off, it came back rejected with a comment. That, I mean, this is getting to be a familiar story in my lab. And, and the, the comment was, is that, well, you know, this has all been, already been reported with CMIC. <laughs> so I wrote back and I said, even <laughs> just because they both start with M doesn't mean they're not different, number one. Number two, this paper is about MIB. It's not about MIC. It's like... <laughs> I thought that was pretty logical. Um, and I asked them to send it out for review, which they had not done. And they sent it out for review, and the reviewers agreed with me. Now, that took six months or so. We submitted the paper in December of 1985, and it was published in July of 1986. Now, during, and so um, it was in under review in the spring of 1986, and I was invited to go give us. Um, to visit UCSF, the Immunology and um, Microbiology Department program, and give a lecture and so forth. So that's what I did. And it was sometime in the spring before this paper was published in Science. And I, I gave my talk, and, and I focused. I, I, I Maybe it had already been accepted, and I knew it had been accepted. That's probably what it was. So I gave this new data. To, to in my talk to the to the people, and after at the end of my talk, this fellow in the back of the room stood up and he said, "Well, you know, this is this is obviously bogus because MIC, I mean MIB expression, is known to cause cell cycle arrest and 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 cause cellular differentiation. That's been well shown in the in the oncogene uh, literature and so forth. So you don't know what you're talking about." 
Now, it turns out that that was Mike Bishop, and I knew about those data. And that's one of the reasons we submitted this paper to science, because it refuted in a very nice, you know, clear-cut way that this that was bogus. That was not correct. Uh, MIB expression was uh, associated with cellular proliferation, G, G1 progression. Well, after the talk, um, I went around and, you know, you go around and you talk to different um, faculty members and so forth. And I have, I had an appointment with, with Harold Varmus. So I go to visit Varmus and he has a little tiny little lab. that's only like you know, six feet by six feet. I mean, an office in his, in his lab, which his lab was, you know, pretty big, but his office was like six feet by six feet. And he, he had, had papers stacked all over the place. And I, he had to clear off the only, the only visiting chair, you know, visitor's chair in the, in the office of all these papers stacked this high, you know? And so I sat down and, and the first thing he said to me was, well, Smith, what have you done in this aisle, hole, this aisle two story? We just had Warner Green through here a couple of weeks ago and he was much more impressive than you are. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was sort of taken aback by that. And I, so I sort of clued him into the fact that I had discovered the IL-2 molecule and the IL-2 receptor and, and, and had um, worked up this model system to be able to study cellular proliferation and study the, the genetics of it and the molecular biology of it. But he wasn't too impressed by that at all. Now, and so um, that was that. And I went, went home to, to Hanover, New Hampshire. Three years later, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Bishop and Varmus for approving Howard Temin's uh, on proto-oncogene hypothesis by showing that the, the Rouse sarcoma virus contained a, a gene that was called VSARC, and it would hybridize in, in hybridization kinetic experiments uh, with uh, a, normal cellular genes, and that was the cellular proto-oncogene CSARC. So that was just interesting. Now, the thing is, years went by, we didn't follow up on CMIB and MIB expression because we, we were trying to discover new genes. And I knew that, that many people of the oncogene um, ilk were already you know, hot on the, on the MIB trail. So, so now we're talking um, you know, 30, 40 years later. During that time, uh, the MIB story has gotten much more complicated. There are three different genes, A, B, and C, MIB, um, normal cellular genes. They're all, the, the MIB genes code for a DNA binding protein that has a DNA binding region, a transactivating region, and a regulatory region. And uh, it has been shown subsequently to be extremely important, particularly in hematopoietic cells um, to cause leukemia and to cause cell cycle progression. The differentiation and the cell cycle arrest that Bishop uh, accused me of uh, refuting um, um, is bogus. And I thought that, I think that's a nice story. So I thought I'd tell you that in, in, in this journal club. So that, that uh, gets us to the end. And, I, and so don't forget to like the video and um, Press on the click on the on the bell and check out the writing tab and my website. And so it's been fun. Thank you.